like to extend We would like to extend a very warm welcome from the Essex branch mentor team and thank you for making time for today's session on navigating success in occupational safety and health. We hope that you will find some gems and takeaways from our guest stories and will find these are relevant to you at whatever stage you have reached in your career. Our primary focus as a mentor team is to offer support to branch members. Our branch committee span all sorts of backgrounds and stages of occupational safety and health achievement. And the support that we as mentors are offering is unique to the Essex branch members journeys. So from those who may be starting out or being drawn into health and safety or just taking an initial interest, for those already working towards a qualification, enhancing career, changing job or seeking IOSH progression. Typically, we can offer guidance on updating your status in IOSH membership from very first steps as an associate through to recognition as a chartered fellow. We are totally open, so you may be a generalist, a student or involved with research and development or be pursuing specialist expertise. Between us, we have achieved decades in very different aspects of health and safety. So please feel free to contact us. And if we don't know, we will signpost you on appropriately. For instance, to the central IOSH membership or the IOSH professional development teams. Today's theme, navigating success, reflects that typically our health and safety journeys have no one single entry point and each journey moves through at a pace touched by external influences. So using our navigational metaphor, an individual occupational self safety and health career may need to steer a course while subject to the influences of the tides, rolling with the waves, monitoring wave points set out in charts, avoiding obstacles like sandbanks and rocks, whilst always keeping a wary eye out for the unlikely but extreme events such as an iceberg hoving into view. It requires adjustments in direction according to ebbs, flows and currents, changing circumstances and the needs and competencies of our fellow travellers. We are delighted to be able to introduce three guest speakers who have agreed to share their compelling stories of success gained in three strikingly different environments, yet populated with common threads and perceptions from their journeys. Our speakers will be telling you about themselves in sequence. And once all three have finished, they will be happy to take any questions you may have at the very end of these presentations. And if you have a question specific to a speaker, if you could put their name before your question in the chat box, that would be fantastic. Our speakers were telling, uh, sorry, now I'm going to hand you over to the first of our guests, um, Jane. Thank you, Sarah, and hello, everybody. Um, I've been asked to, uh, to take you on my journey, so I'm just going to uh, open up my short presentation for you of how I navigated success down the decades. Um, so it's, it started way back in the, in the 1980s. Uh, there was, uh, to set the scene for you, there was a, there was a huge social shift in the, in the early 80s. Uh, the Equal Pay Act had, uh, had been in place for a little over five years. And my first job, uh, I called my branch manager Mr. Everybody was Mr. and Miss. Um, and to have a, a woman working in the uh, engineering workshop was uh, a little uh, strange, to say the least, for a lot of, lot of people. Um, and from uh, that engineering apprenticeship, um, I went on to a training position with the Royal Air Force. Um, and towards the end of the 80s, was proud to have commanded the first mixed sex recruitment training uh, flight that, uh, that passed out of the RAF. And the thing that struck me over this decade 
was that social shift of the equality mindset. Uh, it was uh, a shift both for gender, uh, but we also had the end of Clause 28 and the AIDS crisis during that decade that really meant that diversity and inclusion had moved on in that decade. We went into the 1990s um, and I then took a totally different career path. And when I left the REF, um, I became a rat catcher. Uh, now, the great thing about that, you know, moving from engineering and, and training into, uh, into rat catching was actually it was problem solving um, using a different set of skills. A lot of chemical safety was involved. Um, and then, bizarrely, I ended up working on, in safety for the first time uh, with the Channel Tunnels uh, safety and security team. And that was my first taste of, of safety. And what I learned in this, in this decade, as you see there from my screen, is just the value of transferable knowledge and skills that I'd taken from the equality mindset of the previous decade and my time in the REF training that I was able to put to good use when I was at Eurotunnel and Eurostar, where I recruited new teams, trained them, and put them into operation. Uh, I then moved on to logistics um, at Pitney Bowes. And again, using the transferable skills, uh, I was brought into Pitney Bowes Management Services for logistics because of my safety and security knowledge. They found it easier to give me logistics knowledge than to train a logistics manager to be a safety and security professional. So whatever angle you come at safety, um, your transferable knowledge and skills from a variety of backgrounds is very, very valued. Um, and I found, I found that during my career. Men moved to something a bit more recently, recent, the, the new millennium. Um, the highlights in this millennium was, uh, this is really the, the, the end of my security career and, and the start of my safety career proper. Up until that point, uh, they been very much the focus had been on security um, with the uh, IRA, the real IRA, and then the Twin Towers attack um, and the second Iraq war. Um, and then once the, that had happened, there was, a, there was a pivot. And I faced crossroads in my career, and did I continue in the security career? Um, or did I concentrate on a safety career? Because no longer was safety and security teamed together. The two were seen as very different uh, career paths. I chose to follow the uh, safety career, uh, moving to the Royal Opera House as the head of uh, safety. And whilst I was at the Opera House, I did my master's degree and uh, was lucky enough to have a bit of a eureka moment and uh, developed a new way of measuring noise in the workplace prior to phone apps and uh, managed to uh, achieve the uh, IOSH Practical Project Award and the British Safety Industry Federation's Product Innovation Award. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a video kills the radio star. Well, the telephone app killed my little product, but I'm immensely, immensely proud of my little product. Up until then, you had to spend thousands of pounds to measure noise in the workplace um, with a noise dosometer. Uh, but this was a quick and easy, under a £10 way of, of doing it. So the thing, the learning from that decade was innovation, um, both from my time at the Royal Albert Hall when half an hour before curtain up, we, we lost water to the building and we had five and a half thousand people outside wanted to come in. Uh, we needed to operate safely. Uh, we had no water, so we had no sprinklers, we had no lavatories, we had no kitchen water. It's about how you make things work. Um, and innovative thinking and being able to think outside the box. But also the unvalue and understanding of building rapport with people, being able to work with people and understanding um, how to make things happen and take people with you at the same time, which is so important. Not just go on ahead on your own, but build that rapport and take people with you. So we then come into the 2010s. Like technical hitch there, everybody. Apologies.
So in the in the 2010s, um, again, I went back to, after having worked for myself for a number of years with with my safety product. It was doing very very well. Uh, as I said, the uh, telephone app killed my product, so I was then looking for a job. And I thought, well, I can put uh, the years of uh, of expertise to, to use. And I call this my decade of reflection. Um, and it was about building relationships. And through uh, my knowledge that I'd used, I became a safety trainer. Uh, very, pre uh, very proud of my uh, Nibosh pass marks. Um, and also that uh, the, the time that I, I had worked uh, for TFL so far to date, um, I've had zero riddle and enforcement notices in my past eight years here. Um, and it's also about the giving back. And so therefore I stood to become an elected councillor, which gave me, again, more transferable skills um, on committees and life in public life and becoming a uh, volunteer for the RNLI. And again, using my training expertise in that part of my life. And then to the modern day. So the highlights of where we are now. I'm, I'm moving towards the, the twilight years of my career. I've got 10, 10 or so years left. And so it's about downsizing. Um, it's less of accumulation and now we're into deaccumulation, which offers a lot of insight and reflection. The relationships I've built um, have given me a lot, and I'm now uh, trying to, to give back to people coming up behind me, recognising the personal impact I can have on others. And the learning realisations are it's time to continue to learn and uh, build foundations for the third age. And my foundations for the third age is uh, I've started uh, my own Nordic walking business. And it's about staying fit and healthy and teaching about sea safety. So it's about what my next step is once my career is over. And I'll leave you with the notes with, in the 2020 forecast, which is astrologers apparently view the 2020s as a transition from a patriarchal to a matriarchal age. And I found this quite interesting because on the continual learning front, I went to an IOS event before lockdown and heard a very, very good presentation uh, around invisible women. And it was actually a Sunday Times bestseller, which was a study into the gender data gap that leads to an invisible bias from technology to workplaces. And this piqued my interest because I did my master's on how to make a workplace uh, that fits everybody, tall people, short people. And what I learned was that a lot of the data is purely done on men because they are very reliable, they don't change. Uh, but women apparently uh, change a lot and therefore are not used in data collation. So it's about continual learning and about keeping an open mind. And with that, I'm going to hand over to the next presenter, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Really enjoyed that presentation. And actually, it's a similar um, span of time to, to mine. I'm going to present it in a very different way, but uh, thank you. So I'll just share my screen now. My career has come through a slightly different, different route um, through environmental health. Um, and it's, it's not what I planned for initially. I, I always had a yen to be a teacher and fell into environmental health um, when I decided not to go away to college and look for something more local and um, the job of a student EHO was advertised locally. I joined the local authority. I was their first female student, so it was a bit of a challenge for them. And at my interview, I remember uh, my then boss saying to me, I, you know, I need to know that you're going to be able to cope when we put you into some of these difficult situations that that come up in this picture of environmental health. Um, I was challenged by them. I was challenged by that very first visit to the abattoir where slaughter was in full swing. And I, as the student, was was uh, initiated into the gut room and what inspection would look like. Um, that 
career in environmental health has, has given me a huge number of skills that I'll talk about in just a minute and, and allowed me to, to develop in the way that I have. I moved from that role into a senior EHO role in a different local authority, but although I, I loved the broad brush of the work there, I, I was challenged by enforcement and found I wasn't good at it. So I needed to find something that would, would allow me to use those skills but didn't involve the enforcement side of it. So I had an opportunity while I was working in that second authority to move into the private sector. There was a, um, a consortium which, which was run by the local college that was working with the food industry and was looking for people with my skills to, to develop into their work and work with the food industry. So that was, that was my start. And I then moved into um, a partnership um, and spent 15 years in that partnership working with um, a range of businesses. It, it, it was an incredible time. I, we worked with major retailers. We worked with the soft drinks industry. We were the um, first, we were kind of at the front edge of writing food safety materials for the new qualifications that had been developed. We worked with the Royal Society for Public Health in, in developing their first qualification. So it, it felt like a great time. We wrote the training materials for the soft drinks industry and food safety, the first, the first training materials in that, in that field for formal qualifications. And our work took us around the UK and abroad. Um, I think probably the most challenging work I had in that part of my career was um, uh, a, a journey to Angola. Apparently all the other clients, uh, um, consultants that worked for this particular company that was based in Portugal. We've done a lot of work with them in Portugal. They were based in the oil industry and our involvement with them was around food safety because they ran staff, staff housing and restaurants um, and other elements of food businesses. So much to my family's disappointment, I chose to take that journey. Um, Angola was in civil war at the time and it was advised not to go, but it was an incredible journey. I learned a lot. I experienced what it's like to be in, in um, challenging parts of the world and delivering something that, that means something very different there than it would back in the UK. After my 15 years in, in, in dialogue, um, my, my daughter, I've got two children, and my daughter was, was the wayward one and needed a little bit more of a, I think, a um, a calming influence. So I decided to pull it all in and I moved away from dialogue and set up um, my company, LB Associates, to, to basically work more locally, work from home, work less and steer her through her teenage years. Um, she, she's an absolute dream now, but she was an absolute challenge at that, at that point in time. And that, and that time spent with her was, was very worthwhile. LB Associates expanded. My son is now my business partner and I'm now the one of the senior partners in LBA Safety and we have we have moved on. So I'll talk about that in a in a little while. Oops, excuse me. So what, what has environmental health given me? The broad brush of environmental health looks at safety in its in its largest context, really. It's all about food safety and food integrity. You know, when we think about food and where it comes from and where it ends up, we can't talk about food chains anymore because it's not that simple. It's all about food networks. There's a significant amount of food fraud going on out there. Lots of businesses don't fully understand their role dealing with just what's, what's coming in through their back door and perhaps what's going out through their restaurant or through their, their manufacturing setup without considering that kind of bigger picture of, of, the, of, of, the, whole, of the whole world of food safety, really. It's, it's a very interesting one. Um, environmental health gives you that broad brush of health and safety. They are the other enforcement agency, or not the other one, but, uh, but an enforcement agency for health and safety. Um, we've got public health, and I think in the last year, what we've seen is 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 public health on on you know centre stage with everybody understanding for the first time the picture of infection um, in the wider sense. I mean, we are still with COVID. We are expecting our third wave in the UK. Um, 
but one of the foundations of environmental health is 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 public health and the really the health of of the nation um, environmental protection is is a broad brush with within this um, and you know in looking at clean air in looking at noise pollution in looking at water safety and water pollution the that that journey in environmental health gives you information on all of those things. During my time in, in that work, I, I learned about um, noise as being a, a, a public nuisance. I gained a diploma in acoustics to, to support my work and understand the acoustics picture better. And that, that's really led to um, us understanding better the picture of, of um, workplace noise and workplace controls. We work with clients who, who need to look after safety um, of their, their staff, as, as we all do. Um, but that health picture is a really big one that I think for many of our clients has not been up on their agenda um, in, in the past. And looking at the health of their staff is a significant one. So as one example, you know, a, a noise in the workplace and considering how best to protect people is something that, that we've learned as, as that um, environmental health input. And housing communities, looking at that picture of housing um, and, and how people live. In one of my earlier slides, I didn't explain to you the picture of the horse in the kitchen, but um, one of my, my, my complaints, a complaint was made to me when I was an environmental health officer by a neighbour um, about a, a family who had a horse living in the kitchen. Now, of course, you get a complaint like that across your desk and you think, how crazy is that? Um, but when we went to investigate, sure enough, the horse was living in the kitchen um, and it, it, it brought with it all, all the challenges of, of um, animal waste material, um, insanitary living conditions, a part of the public housing stock and a significant impact on, on their, their neighbours. So there are, there are so many challenges that we, we've seen across, across that range of activities. Um, people live their lives in very different ways and some of them are not very sanitary. We, we have examples of the hoarders. We have dealt with people who hoard clothing in their property. So they have small pathways through and create significant fire challenges and rodent challenges for, for themselves and their neighbours. Um, we deal with people who, who store their own waste materials um, in margarine tubs, in black sacks, in the bath, in milk bottles. Um, and, and it becomes then an insanitary situation that you have to deal with. So those housing problems might not just be, um, is the house in good repair or poor repair? Is the house in multiple occupation? But is the house fit to live in because of the activities of the of the residents who live there? Um, our work currently as part of LBA safety is, is all about consultancy and advice, is about undertaking audits and inspection and is about delivering training, both regulated training and bespoke training in, in a range of areas. And that knowledge and expertise I gained from my early years in environmental health has put me in really good stead to give me that much wider picture um, of health and, and safety. So our current operation then at LBA Safety, there are two partners, as I said earlier, and I'm, I'm extremely fortunate that my son has followed me into this career through the environmental health um, uh, direction and is now my business partner. Fortunately, he's the techie one in the business. And I feel that as I approach my fourth decade here, that, that I'm becoming the techie dinosaur. So it's absolutely needed. I think it's important to, to know your limits and, and, and know your strengths too. We currently have five staff. Three of our staff work solely in our education um, element of the business now, as we work with in Essex, currently about 110 schools, uh, looking after their food safety operations and, and the wider picture of safety and catering operations in schools. And then we use associates, people who are experienced in, in, in various uh, elements of environmental health work to support that, that wider picture of, of our client base. In terms of our success criteria, I have always valued uh, an organic growth 
process. We don't advertise, people come to us generally by word of mouth. If there is any advertising that we do, it's all about training courses that we have and that we're, we're delivering. But we've been very, very fortunate that we've developed really good relationships with lots and lots of clients. And many of those arrangements are long term. You know, some of our clients have worked with us now for over 20 years. And it's lovely that they will return to us time and time again for, for support, for advice and for training. Um, for us, it's really important to know, to know your worth. Um, and that's that's not just really about the, the financial picture. That's that's about understanding what your knowledge and expertise is, what your competence is and what you can offer businesses in that widest sense. Um, our client work is is about partnerships. And I think I've already said that in, in the fact that we work, we like to work long term. But it is really important to get to know who the clients are, because although we're not enforcers, you know, in the enforcement role, essentially you're telling people what they must do. But in the client role, it's it's them understanding what they need to do, considering it from their business perspective, and then you or us holding them to account to achieve that. Um, obviously, communication, a big, big element there. We, we um, set ourselves within the, the businesses that we work in so that we, we can have the ear of the people who might be doing what could be considered as the maybe the, the jobs at the lower end of the spectrum of the business. But we also have to have the ear of the people who make the decisions, the CEOs, the boards, the owners of, of the business. And in, in terms of culture, it's about understanding their, their culture. You know, in the picture that I've shown on the slide here, this is one of our um, clients. This is the bar in their, in their nightclub. Um, and they deal with VIPs and what they call the VIPs. Security is very heavy for them. Um, the aesthetic of, of the, 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 the business, they're, they're, they're looking at the front is really important for them. But it, but it is essential that, that they don't get lost in the beauty of what they have and the client base in what they do. And we can hold them to account for those safety issues. And, and at their end of the market, it, I mean, it's been a real education for us looking at safety in a very different different way you know there will be there will be nothing like stainless steel there is no such thing as a as a normal fire extinguisher that's plonked in a public place there it all has to meet the aesthetic of the business uh, the culture of the business but bringing along the culture of safety along the way so positioning really important with them positioning to allow your voice to be heard and allow you to hold them to account while hearing really the voices of everybody in that business and making sure is is considered so that broad view then of, of what we do in, integrity is really important over the years people will will call and say um, we're in a spot of bother I need some risk assessments we're in a we're in a spot of difficulty could you could you come and work something out and provide a report for us um, we're not in that game we, we don't do that kind of work if, if a business doesn't want to engage wholeheartedly in looking at the picture of safety, whatever, whatever it is, food safety, occupational safety, um, we, we don't want to engage with those businesses. For us, um, sustainability of our business is important. Our reputation is important. Getting it right with our customers is important. And therefore that fit is really important. How we how we work with them, how they work with us. There has to be a huge amount of trust on both sides, because if we want them to be completely open and honest with us as their external consultant, um, there has to be trust and there has to be trust on both sides. In terms of fee structure, I can't really offer you much on that. It's always been a challenging one. When I first set up a business, I remember taking advice from um, a business advisor who was telling me how much I should be charging a day. And I found that that really doesn't work. We lose work because we quote too much. We gain work really, really quickly because we charge too little. There's a middle ground somewhere, um, but it's, it's. I think you have to go back to knowing your worth and, and sticking with it. And those clients that want you will use you and those that don't will not. 
but you need to be able to get up in the morning and you need to want to go to work and you need to enjoy what you do and if you don't enjoy what you do it's time I think to to move on and look in a, in a different direction so uh, while there are frustrating days while there are challenging days ultimately I think I can look back on on the, all of the work that I've done and say I've enjoyed pretty much all of it. Whoops, we've gone the wrong way. <laughs> there are challenges. There are challenges always in that self-employment role. I think there are lots of challenges for everybody working these days. But but time is a is a difficult one to manage. You know, I have I have been the one that, as maybe many of you have, that I send my emails at two a.m. in the morning, and clients get reports from me at on a Sunday afternoon at four o'clock. It is very very difficult to manage to manage time and to meet all the targets that are, that are set. It's difficult sometimes to work away from home. And, you know, I, I have um, left my children with my husband at Heathrow Airport on a Sunday afternoon with both of them crying as I walk away to, to a week away from work. And so those things have been challenging. And there is, it's, it's quite difficult to balance. Sometimes that family impact is, is not an easy one to square up, but I think broadly, I've achieved that balance. The family have not been significantly impacted and I've taken some decisions which have allowed me to grow, which have allowed my family to develop and which have allowed um, really, a, a, I think now I can look back and say, while there was imbalance at points, it's, it's been broadly balanced, but it's, it's a hard one, that one. It's really hard to balance that. And then in reflection, um, I think you always have to learn at the time that you think you know it all is the time you have to walk away because there is never that that place we are always learning and if we look at what the last year with COVID has taught us there have been massive amounts to learn and we are going to continue to learn from that for a number of years I think if we just looked at um, ventilation and infection control um, that's been huge over the last year and, and so we will always be learning to know your limits, that it's very easy for somebody to come to you and ask you to do a job which, which is, is outside your comfort zone, outside your sphere of knowledge. So you have to know your limits. And, and while learning is important, don't, don't take those risks with your clients. If you haven't got the right level of expertise, you can't do the job. So balance we've talked about, and here the balance is about carrying on on that path of continuing professional development, but, but always knowing your limits. Um, and as I said before, it's been a great journey. I'm not, I'm not done yet. I've got some more things to do, but I feel you know, blessed that I will be handing over this business um, to a member of my family. And the business has been in, in significant growth for the last three years. And I, I hope that it works going on for the future. So, Thank you for listening to me today. I hope that's given you a little bit of insight into my work. And I'm now going to hand you over to Caroline. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. There we go. So I, uh, in, in, on the other end of Leslie and Jane, do not have decades to show you. Um, however, I, I do have a few things that I can like I can um, share with you, and obviously that's why I also put mine as navigating towards success, because um, as we just said with Leslie, uh, we, we're still on the path. I obviously I'm I'm at the beginning of my path, so um, yeah. Um, a little overview of what I'm going to tell you today. Um, I'll obviously give you a heads up on my education and my work experience so far, um, how I got here, as to where I'm today. And at the end, I'll give some personal recommendations. So as for the education, I'm a drilling engineer. Um, I studied in Germany at the Technical University in Freiberg. And during that time, I um, also actually did a mining apprenticeship with the Saxonian Mining Authority, which I did actually only in order to get more um, easily internships. Because at the beginning, even though I knew I wanted to end up in drilling, it was very hard to get any internships. So as a mining apprentice, not only do they actually want to have you because that's good for the mining authority relationship, but also uh, you get paid a little bit more. So that's very good as well. 
Um, with that, I did um, in total nine internships across um, the energy landscape, most of them in Germany, uh, one also in Poland. This was in underground mining, uh, coal mining and salt mining. I was in geothermal energy, in production engineering, and also then finally, as I wanted to, in drilling engineering on site, etc. At the end of the studies, I decided that I want to actually spend the time that you normally spend about six months or whatever on the final thesis on a subject that really is uh, close to my heart and that's going to be useful. So I found a company that was looking to um, update the risk assessment and I created a tool for them for the risk assessment for drilling and work over operations. Um, happy to say when last year I was looking for a job again, I spoke to uh, my mentor from back then and that risk assessment tool is actually still being used and has been uh, applied to the rest of the company. Um, so I finished uh, university in 2015. Beginning of 2015 was a major um, shock in the oil price um, or end of 2014. So basically there were no jobs out there. However, because of that dual background of drilling engineering, but also the passion for health and safety, I was able to land a graduate drilling engineer position was NGE&P, nowadays that's Neptune Energy, uh, in Germany and um, was focusing all of my assignments actually on health and safety. After that, because NG was being sold, um, I had to find a new position. So I was able to actually land another um, graduate position at this time as a well and field engineer with Slumberjay, which is an international, yeah, uh, big, very big um, oil and gas service company. I did um, start basically at zero again. I went for three months training to Abu Dhabi and then was based in, in the Netherlands, but covered jobs all over Europe on and offshore. I uh, really loved it. Uh, the only thing was wireline is that it's very ad hoc. You never really know when uh, in the morning where you're going to end up in the afternoon. And um, you can't really plan much life around it or for example, anything volunteering. I decided to leave that job and to actually finish my um, NIBOSH National General Certificate at the same time as actually doing the NIBOSH Diploma. So for that, I um, moved to my sister, who is actually also in the audience now in the UK with her family. And every day I would go to, um, to Birmingham, do the classes. And then the beauty of the UK uh, in health and safety is that all the conferences, et cetera, are free. So that was really good. Um, and with all that networking in the UK, um, I then was able to uh, find a position as health and safety advisor for Aquaterra Energy, based in Great Yarmouth. Uh, obviously compared to Slumberjay, Aquaterra is a tiny um, service company, but nonetheless international, which was still very important to me. And I was really looking forward. However, pandemic hit. So first I got put on furlough and then unfortunately I had to be let go. Um, so I was back on the market and looked up all the companies that I had been in touch with before or whatever was out there and I was able to, that was the wrong way, to find a position as CQ engineer with Boscalis and at the moment I am a part of the pool in the dredging division but working on projects in France. So that's basically me. Now, how did I get here? Um, I always say uh, dreaming big is, is one of the key aspects of it. Um, I never got told that, oh, you can't do this or you can't do that. So our dad um, was also in the oil and gas industry and that's why I, I knew about it and I'd heard about it. I knew kind of the lifestyle. Um, he was a lot gone, but um, we were uh, uh, our dream to you of three um, at home. So my mum, my sister and me, and we never had anything that was holding us back. So what did I want to do? Huh? Be creative. Just because it's unheard of doesn't mean that it can't be done. Ask yourself why you want to do something. What are the details that really get you excited? What is it about a job or um, a career that actually makes you tick? And then when you know that, obviously find out how. What resources do you need and how do you get those resources? Is it connections? Is it money to get a certain uh, qualification? What is it? And then obviously it's said that um, very often there are challenges or setbacks, um, but see those not as an issue, but rather as opportunities to be even more, think outside the box. And not to forget, very important as always, it's a lot easier when you're not doing it alone. So get yourself support, uh, find ways to discuss or exchange uh, with other people, learn from other people, 
and uh, yeah, put things into perspective, it, it does definitely help. And that's why I was very happy when I was approached to, to actually do this for the mentoring group, um, because I've had mentors as well. So since my sister is here, and I think I can't see her because her camera is off, but still, um, we originally, when, when I was little, I wanted to become a captain because my sister loved seals. So the plan was I become a captain of a um, marine biology vessel or whatever, and she would be my marine biologist on that vessel. This way we could work together. Didn't quite work out this way, but still, I decided then to at least get the, the international part and um, the, the working all over. So I decided I would follow the footsteps of my father into the oil and gas. And then um, why did I want to do that? Because you would be working with people from all over, any nationality, regardless of the language that you speak, you have a common goal, you have um, something that keeps you together, even if you're stuck in the middle of the ocean on the platform. Obviously that does bring uh, a little bit more money sometimes into, into your pocket or in the piggy bank, but it also provides you with the time that you can actually spend that money in because what, or at least I never saw any benefit in having a job that would pay well, but actually not avoid, uh, provide you with any time for, for doing anything with that money that you would have. So what did I have to do? Uh, for me, I tried to get a position right after um, my A-levels. However, I was told, mm, not really possible. You don't have any technical background, etc." So I decided, okay, I will, uh, I will go to university and I will do uh, the course because then once I have that, nobody can actually say that I'm not supposed to be in oil and gas. Huh? Once you have the qualification, that's your ticket in. Nobody can say you shouldn't be there. Obviously, uh, challenges and, and, and back, uh, setbacks, as I said, even in the internships, um, because I knew already from the beginning, from the first semester, that I wanted to go into oil and gas, um, I then just saw the opportunity to say, okay, at least I do the internships underground, like I said, I would never have the opportunity afterwards to go there. So why not do it now, get paid, definitely be able to say at the end, this is not what I want to do, but then uh, you, you have that experience as in, a, in addition. Um, also, one of the things for the internships, for example, was that I wanted to absolutely go offshore. Now, in Germany, there's not a lot of offshore going on. In the UK, it might have worked. One of the things that recruiters kept uh, telling me was that I did not have the offshore survival training. So I actually got myself a sponsor and did it so that this way nobody could actually say, oh, no, you can't do it because of uh, I created my own uh, my own opportunities with it. Unfortunately, I still didn't go offshore, but still. And then um, the support that I was getting was through, for example, the Society of Petroleum Engineers. So I was very active in there, but also just no networking um, at university was through Rotrack, for example, just getting other people, other opinions, other feedbacks that was important to me. And then I think most of us have said um, that it's not really about a certain destination, but actually that the pass is the goal. So find opportunities to expand your horizon. If there aren't any, get involved and create them. Um, and remember that to reach a summit, you always first need to do the hard work and climb that mountain, however big that mountain may be. Uh, so come prepared uh, for a long journey, bring your snack and, and your backpack. Uh, it might take a little while. And not to forget, just as in nature, um, don't litter. If you're bad mouthing about other people that will come back, it will also be the reputation, your business card that is out there. Especially as a woman, the focus, especially in oil and gas was already on me anyway, because I was just like, like Leslie was saying earlier, or, or Jane as well, you're already, how do you say, in, in the visor of everyone. So if you do something that's not really good, that is also impacting anyone coming after you. So you might actually be locking any opportunities for women after you. For example, when I did my first um, internship on, uh, on the drilling rig, uh, one of the recruiters really had to step forward uh, and, and say, no, no, she, she will be able to do that, et cetera. And everybody was so pleased with the outcome that they had loads of interns after that too. So that was good. But always uh, take time for rest along the way and take the scenery. 
So as I said, huh, for the uh, opportunities, underground mining was not really what I wanted, but I still did it. And I'm very happy that I did because it opened up, especially in, in regards of health and safety, so much more that I know that other people wouldn't. For the um, getting involved, uh, this is, for example, where I like to volunteer. So again, with the Society of Petroleum Engineers, or now even with IOSH. So I've been involved with the IOSH East Anglia branch, and I'm still now involved with the IOSH Offshore Group. Obviously, if, if, if you have a long journey ahead, that will take time and extra effort, but it's definitely worth it. And this is what I said. Now, remember, there are people watching. Uh, there might be more barriers coming up. So uh, make sure that you, you keep yourself uh, in line with what you want to see from others as well. For me, taking a, a break is also uh, sailing or, or actually uh, um, seeing what it is. However, the sailing part is, is still kind of what is in line with health and safety. I know the risk, I, I assess the risk, and it's a, it's a nice metaphor, especially for me now working in dredging, that I can use as well with the guys on, on the vessels. Now, when things don't go your way, best thing is to first have an idea. Be, a, be clear about your goal. For me, the goal was to work offshore. Oop, there we go. Um, if you see any, any stones, um, first of all, identify the stones that are in your way. Find alternative ways or make them stepping stones. And always remember, follow your own compass and enjoy your journey. Just like Leslie said before, you can also step back and say, no, this work I'm not taking on. And when then you do actually take that step, uh, keep your eyes on the horizon um, so that you can identify any new roads, any other um, headings that you want to take. So that you reach your goal. And then obviously when you're at your goal that you celebrate that moment as well. So as I said, for me, it was working offshore on rotation. That was my goal. I was at the time that I'm now describing just to give you a little bit more concept and actually realistic example that this is not just blah, blah on the slide. Um, I was working um, as a field engineer, um, always ad hoc, etc. But I wanted to make um, this actually a career that was su um, sustainable and long term. So working offshore on rotation was my dream. However, the oil price was still bad. I didn't have that connection in the UK market. So um, what could I actually do? To, because as a drilling engineer or as a wireline engineer, you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, I thought, okay, I do have that passion for health and safety and I do like to work with people. So why not actually do this? Be, uh, become a health and safety professional for offshore installations and then work on rotation. Um, I could have also gone into health and safety. I know my sister and I uh, had a few talks about it because I was obviously living at her place, so we did uh, obviously talk about it. Um, why not change the industry? Why are you making it so hard for yourself to, to not just go into any industry that's looking for health and safety? Well, I didn't want that because I, I like the technical aspect of it and I like the attitude that people were bringing to work. Um, identifying uh, the, the new routes on the horizon is something that I read recently in a, in a report um, about I think it was safe identification, that I seem to be always adding on to my puzzle. So not just finishing the puzzle, but whatever comes, I add it on and I just make the puzzle bigger. And I love to make lemonade out of any lemon that comes my way. And obviously back to uh, enjoy the moment. Uh, so take, take a, a cocktail or whatever you like, a tea, um, whatever makes your heart uh, beat faster, that's something positive. Now the personal recommendations at the end, always invest in yourself. You are your greatest asset. If nobody else is investing in you, invest yourself. Don't wait for others to do it. Be true to your own values and beliefs because you are the only one who has to live with yourself every single day. And don't limit yourself. Always ask, let others say no. This is something that I was actually told by um, a senior manager in, in I think my first company, yeah? And that stuck with me for always. So every time if, if there is something, I just ask and let's see. Right? The worst thing that can happen is that somebody says no. 
if you get an opportunity, like for example, speaking here at this um, at this event, uh, don't say no um, just because you haven't done it um, before. Think about it and and start to do it. Get uncomfortable. People ask you because they believe that you can do this. Obviously, we will see if you actually believe this too or not. And then uh, be the wave, create the rippers, uh, make followers, not Instagram followers and whatever, but if you're leading the way, people will automatically follow you. And remember, you are the CEO of your life. Promote and demote people, feelings, situations and objects as you see fit. And that brings us to the questions. I will stop sharing my slides now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Thank you, um, Jane and, and Leslie. Um, we, we haven't actually got that many questions, but we've got some, some, some nice observations here. So um, uh, first of all, from um, the Irish uh, president-elect, uh, Louise Hoskins has come in with a nice one here talking about the um, environmental health professionals, that they all really have great stories from their time working in local communities. And, and the, the, the work tends to go largely unnoticed. So I'm guessing that's, that's a comment there uh, for you, uh, Leslie. Did you, did you find that early in your career that um, you felt perhaps slightly unnoticed? Um, do you know what? I never really thought about whether I was noticed or not, but, but getting into that career, I was amazed at the breadth of it. So, you know, one day you're working in an abattoir doing meat inspection and, and sort, sorting the fit animals that can go into the human food chain from the unfit ones that, that you that you couldn't. The next day you might be be dealing with um, a, a food business for a complaint, then a housing issue, then a drainage issue. You know, there, there are so many elements to it and you're working in the heart of your communities. And and quite often, you know, people people are really struggling with with their own lives um, and have these these problems and and the, the the local eh team can can offer massive benefit and yet i think they are largely largely unsung and i think um during the pandemic their role has perhaps come back to the front again you know they are in the communities looking at covid controls and supporting businesses and giving advice so you know i think they should be front and center in communities not hidden in the background thank you um thank you leslie um one from uh, jimmy quinn our current um, president and and that's saying um jane's thoughts please um uh, it's saying your presentation was awesome james uh, uh jane sorry so so uh, you've got so many transferable skills that um our veterans always bring to any company whether working on your own or as a team uh, whether in safety or, or or back in the in the military services um, and, he, and he loved your presentation. Um, he, he, he's observing, he's hoping that you're a member of the IOSH Armed Forces and Veterans Group on LinkedIn. Um, are, are, are you in those? Yeah, I'm ashamed to say no. Ah, right. Well, then, <laughs> there's something <laughs> new to do this be. week then. I, I will be, I will be. And I, I totally agree with those comments. I think the the number one skill that, that veterans bring to the workplace, and, and I, I did feel guilty for not belonging to, to that group because uh, it, I, I play a large part in the uh, veterans group here at TFL um, because the big skill that veterans bring um, is that they get people. You know, being, being uh, a member of the armed forces, you are living and working alongside people 24-7 and depending on the job that you do, uh, often your life is in those people's hands. You are, you know, in my early days in the RAF as a weapons engineer, you know, I, I had to rely on my on my colleagues and Caroline probably felt the same in, in the high hazard industry that, that she works in, that, you know, you need to be able to trust your colleagues, that there is a, a natural self-discipline, which is point number two, is a natural self-discipline that comes along with it. But also that it makes you good at listening to people and what they need and then tailoring what you've got to, to meet that need. Um, and it is about building rapport and relationship building, and that is the big strength that the veterans bring to our workplace. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Jane. Um, a question here from, uh, or an observation from uh, Kieran Delaney, um, and, and that is that, uh, that uh, perhaps more towards Leslie, that it's fantastic to see somebody who utilizes the IOF code of conduct with regards to their business. 
uh, Leslie, um, integrity, you had the integrity to walk away from a client who may only want to pay lip service to safety. Now, I think that's something we've all come across at some point in our career in various shape or form. Um, uh, Leslie, anything you, you'd, you'd like to add to that? Is that something you come across regularly as a, as a, as a consultant? No, it's not. It's not a regular thing, but but it but it comes up from time to time. And I think you know when when you're in the 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 self employment route, it's sometimes hard. You're looking at where or can look at where your next job's coming from or where your next you know income's coming from. But I thought, you know, absolutely fundamental to what we do is is safety and health and. And I, I really don't want to entertain businesses that, that, that don't engage. And I think for, for all of the client base we have, sometimes it's, it, it, it's hard to get people to understand what they need to do and to get them to engage fully. And I think, you know, we look at our clients and we have to understand their business perspective and where they come from and therefore how we can steer them to, to head in that right direction. But, but, and, and so those clients are with us and we're working hard and, and learning from them and they're learning from us. But those that come in that say, uh, you know, I, I need you to write some risk assessments. I cannot write a risk assessment for a business. I can support a business to write a risk assessment within. I, I know the principles, but they are the experts. They are the people who know what they what they do. Um, and, and they are um, the people who should be writing the risk assessments, maybe facilitated by teams like us. But no, we will not take on that kind of work because fundamentally it's, it's wrong. Um, integrity is everything. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I know we have uh, um, Jimmy and Louise on 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 the, on the call. Um, Jimmy, you got any comments? If you'd like to come off mute, if you can, and, uh, um, and give us your reflections on 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 navigating success, maybe early in your career, or, or how do you make the first steps, or how do you yeah. get your voice heard, perhaps? No, fantastic, and thanks for the opportunity, mate. I mean, you know, just reflecting on the three the three presentations, they were all dynamic. And um, they're all passionate and, and 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 they were all fantastic. And and I was looking at where I've come in my career and and, and similar and similar um to Jane. I, I took the decision when I did leave the services that I would continue on. And I was offered the chance to go back and do private security and all the other bits and pieces, but I thought, no, I'll I'll I'll, I'll break the link. And 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 I love that that term as well that, that, that came out as well from Caroline about you know dream big and, and I did dream I did dream that at some stage I would have some sort of input in volunteering for IOSH never did I think I would be the president um, but I did dream big about making a success of a second career and when you look at Jane Jane could be making plastic bags in a factory and still would be awesome because you have those amazing skills to interact with people and see things other people don't see and again on top of that you could do anything that you want so I took a great joy from listening to Leslie, Caroline and Jane all different stories but all essentially the same you know they have that integrity driven passionate dynamic and, and it's just I mean I'm on holiday today uh, and as I text Brent and I say, you know, I hope I'm not speaking today, Brent, because I'm on holiday. And I was out in the garden and I thought, no, I'm going to come and listen to this today as well. And and what a great hour and a bit it's been. So, yeah, I, I see a lot of what I've done and, and exactly these three dynamic and fantastic people. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for taking the time out on such a gorgeous day here in the UK as well to, to, to come and to, to come back to the day job. Um. Look, Louise, um, I, I'm hoping you're still on the, the line. Um, yeah, I'm here. What the, I... group, the, the group we've had, we've had three great female presenters. And, mm. and so you're, you're, you're coming into role as a, as a female president. Um, any reflections on, on how you get early career success or how you make an impression, perhaps, as a woman? I mean, we can say the, the three women previously have given us, given us their thoughts. Anything you have or, or, or maybe just to reflect on what they've said? Yeah, um, I mean, three really fantastic um, presentations. And thank you so much for reaching out to me to let me know that you were going to be hosting this as well. Um, I, I come from a similar background to Leslie, so environmental health, and I completely agree. You know, all of those skills that we bring into what we do is absolutely invaluable. Um, I think in terms of my early career, 
um you know i i was a, a young eho when i started so i think i was the youngest on my course and i was only just 21 when i qualified um straight out of uni so and and i was ambitious and i was hungry to make change and i think you know it, it's having that i had really i had fantastic managers for the first 10 years which gave me a really solid foundation um and you know something that and 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 those of you on the call some of you will remember this from the early 90s was when the six pack descended on us and we all had to start doing risk assessments and i was working as a 23 year old in the co-op then and i was given the whole of the non-food division to do manual handling assessments in and and it's just about you know taking the challenge and working it through and and knowing that you know you 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 know reaching out having mentors being a mentor mentor all of those things that we're talking about and and really supporting each other and just keep going you know um but i i, I i'm going to just say one other thing as well because i'm loving the nautical themes that are going on here um and for those of you that know me i do like to use the nautical theme as well um and, and I'm going to leave you with something, which is, um, you know, right now we're we're all going through really. It's a difficult time for everybody. Um, and in sailing, those of you that sail will know this. If you're sailing against the wind, you can't go directly to your destination. You have to tack and go from side to side, and you have to keep adjusting and adapting to the conditions that you find yourself in. You can't just go in one direction but if you get it just right with the right crew you can go faster than the wind and to places you never thought fathomable so just think about that one and I should be sailing right now on my sailing holiday but it got cancelled <laughs> I think we all know the feeling <laughs> all our holidays have been cancelled again and in some cases again and again which is uh, quite painful but hopefully Hopefully we'll get a few opportunities to get away and get some time off for all of us later this year. And I, and I, and I know that um, I'm particularly one of our presenters. Uh, you know, uh, you said a great event. Thank you for having us. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Um, Mark, uh, I think you're going to sum up, aren't you? Yes, I think uh, Sarah's got one slide to put on with the contact details. I don't know if you want to share that, Sarah. Okay. So uh, that concludes today's uh, presentation, Navigating Success, which was brought to you by the IOS Essex Group Mentors. mentors. Uh, a very big thank you to Jane, Leslie and Caroline for three thought-provoking and truly inspirational presentations. Uh, the IOS, branch, uh, ment IOS Essex Branch Mentors contact details uh, are now on the screen. And again, please don't hesitate to contact us if we can support you or guide you in your own safety development. Thank you everyone for attending today. We hope uh, we have the privilege of seeing you all and talking to you all in the very near future. Thank you. Okay, Graham. Oh, yeah. um, can we just stop on the committee just for a few seconds <clears throat> after everybody's exited the meeting? Thank you all for attending. <laughs>